Psalms 51, 1 through 17. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner, when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me the wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness, and let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice accepted to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, then you will delight in the right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings when bulls will be offered on your altar. That's a beautiful psalm. I think it's one that it makes it a classical piece of literature because it's one we can all relate to. Any of you ever feel that you've created such sins and transgressions you don't want God to look at you? Perceive them, you're embarrassed or ashamed. And in this depression, there's, people will sometimes take this psalms and they try to break down the theology and go a little in a direction that's okay to them. It's okay to wander in, but I don't know if it's okay. One, for instance, when it talks about, indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. There's this debate. Are children born sinners or not, right? And this people will pull from this and they'll say, well, Scripture says this. But no. This is an emotional plea. This is an emotional letter. They have felt ashamed from the beginning. They have felt unworthy from the beginning. And I think if we think about ourselves, our children, and our lives, there are many amongst us, many children who grow into adults that felt ashamed from the beginning. A couple weeks ago, we did the exercise where we put a piece of tape on you, right? At the beginning of the service. And by the end of the service, not all, but many of you forgot it was even there. That that taint or that stain or that piece had followed you. As we walk into the season of Lent, that's what we're hoping to do. We're hoping to shed that shame. And maybe shedding that shame means prayer. Maybe it means forgiving yourself. Maybe shedding that shame means committing to a new record player in your mind. We know we all have our minds. Our minds are like old broken records. They like to repeat the same story over and over. Maybe we commit to breaking habits of breaking that record machine. The scripture says, they were a sinner from the beginning. I always have, uh, I read it from my own Bible, a little picture of, one of my babies in the belly. I can tell you by which year. <laughs> uh, 2016, so this is little Roro. And you can see his little hand and his little head. The little guy, how could you call that a sinner? <laughs> <laughs> He's squished in there. The dude's barely living. <laughs> He's barely alive. But I like this. I like this lead because... Something we can all kind of notice um, is when a woman's carrying a child, you'll oftentimes hear that she has a glow, right? She has this glow, this beauty about her. 
Keep that in mind as we go into Mark. I'm going to read now from Mark. Because Mark is going to talk about the glow within Jesus. See, it's not just an outward thing that happens. It's something from within that shines through. Something changes the record tape in your mind of this world. The covenant from the old ways to the new ways. No longer are you to see yourself as sin from the beginning. You are all a beloved child of God, called to listen from the beginning. All right, so we're going to transition from the Old Testament to the New as we make this Lenten journey. Mark 1, 29-39. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew and James and John. Oh, this is the fever. Sorry, guys. No, that was not good. Okay, Mark 9, verses 2 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrifying. And then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore but only Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell them no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thank you. So times change, and we're on a mountain. I could go into the historical piece, I could talk about how this mountain is symbolic of Moses, and I could talk about Elijah, and I could talk about those pieces. And that's all fair, good theology. But I think sometimes when we talk about the theology, or we try to make something more than it is, we miss the most important message of all. We miss the humanness and God meeting us right there in that messiness. Right there on the mountain, you kind of have to wonder, Peter, specifically, because he's mentioned quite a lot, mainly because he opens his mouth and says the wrong thing, but they're called to go with Jesus. Jesus knows what he's doing. He knows that Peter needs to see something. And so he takes Peter to this mountain, and, James, and they go, and they're with Jesus, and they're praying. And by this time, they had seen, as we've learned in Mark, they have seen Jesus um, triumphant over evil spirits. They have seen Jesus triumphant over physical ailments. They have seen Jesus triumphant in strange and glorious ways. And like we've talked about, the anxiety, the energy of Jesus only gets higher. <laughs> and it can get, feels like, no higher than this mountaintop. So here they are on this mountaintop, and they see Elijah and Moses. And this part has always befumbled me a little bit. Hear me out. Because the scripture doesn't give as many details as I would like. <laughs> to be honest, how did Peter and them know, the other disciples know, that this was Elijah and Moses? Did, did Elijah and Moses have a big golden necklace on that says Elijah? <laughs> Moses? <laughs> how did they know who these people were? Right? Something is a miss. We're not given all the details. I doubt it's giant gold signs, but I could be wrong. Um, something's a miss, but something, here's my philosophy, and I want you to think about it this week. What do you think happened? Because we are not given all the details. I suspect, here's my theory, and I love debate, so if you suspect something different, come debate. Um, I suspect it was on a spiritual level. Like something inside their soul was like, you're Moses. Have you ever met somebody and you just know instantly who they are? Something is amiss. 
It's easier to relate this to another stronger emotion. Have you ever met somebody and you just know you'll never like each other? <laughs> okay, so that, maybe that might be a little more relatable. But on a deep spiritual level, they notice, they see the person, and they know who this person is. I suspect he just knew this was Moses, and he just knew this was Elijah. And then you have to beg the question, because again, many, many of the details are left out. And we're learning from scripture, Jesus oftentimes said, don't tell everybody this now, right? So he's literally giving direction to withhold information until we are ready. I kind of consider this in a similar way with children. It's not that I'm trying to misguide them. I withhold information until they're ready, right? Until they're ready to hear it. Or until I perceive that they're ready, which is, can be wrong. Uh, but here they are. Did Jesus and Elijah and Moses, what was their interaction like? Because I have to assume on some level, Jesus has a spiritual connection with these folks already, right? And in the Catholic tradition, and I think it's a little iffy for Methodists to understand it in this way, but we always had a patron saint. And so you would like pray. You're not supposed to pray to that patron saint, but pray with them. I don't know. You can go into that road. But you create a special relationship with a saint that, you're, um, that you have decided to reflect or work through, um, through catechism. Uh, there's always that one, I wasn't her, but there was always that one strong willed girl that would pick Joan of Arc. <laughs> but you're supposed to pick that one. I was lazy and just picked St. Catherine and St. Francis because those were my names and I figured I'd remember them. <laughs> but you picked a saint, you kind of remember. So here's Jesus with these, what we would call patron saints or people of glory in our context. And here's Jesus with Moses and Elijah. But it doesn't say what happened. Like, when Moses and Elijah come into this cloud space, and there's the disciples behind them, did Moses, like, push one of the disciples away? Did he break them? You see what I'm saying? Like, just like, we're going to put Peter over here and James over here. Like, no, what? Come on, how did the reaction happen? Or did Moses and Elijah come and sit, and then Jesus give them a high five? Hey, man, what's up? What was the reaction? We don't know. We don't know what was said. And we don't know if maybe in that conversation, possible conversation or not, then they figured out, oh, this is, that's Moses and that's Elijah. Well, we just don't know all the details. And it's frustrating. Because we're detailed people. We're story people. But I have to wonder if perhaps in this story we're not given all the details because it's not about us in control. And I get that suspicion because of Peter. Peter, once he recognizes whether it's a gold chain on his necklace or Moses constantly partying people or whatever, I get this vision that like Peter recognizes he's not in control and something big is happening here. Something significant. And Peter does what we humans all like to do. We like to fix the problem rather than sit in the problem, right? I have an example. I was feeling so sorry. Jackie, she had to put her dog down, and it, I didn't want her to go alone, so I went with her, and it was a three-hour thing. It was so sad. And the whole time I was there, I kept praying and thinking to God, asking, what do I say? What do I not say? But deep down, I wish I could have just made her dog healthy and whole again and run around, right? I wish I could have just fixed her problem, but I couldn't. It's easier to fix a problem than it is to sit in reality. Sometimes as I sit with all of you and I pray with all of you guys, I'll sit in prayer, and I have to check my own ego and say, Catherine, this isn't about you fixing their problem. This is about sitting with them while God and them work through this journey. But Peter is human like the rest of us. And Peter knows what to do. Okay, we're going to build one tent for Elijah, one tent for Moses, and one tent for Jesus. That makes sense, right? Like the tabernacle, like we talk about Jesus in a box. Peter's like, I got this. We're just going to put you all back in a box. And he says the wrong thing, and he says the wrong thing on a couple levels. He also then at some point equates Moses and Elijah on the same level with Jesus. And we know this because the description of a mountaintop is a peak. And here's Peter like, oh, we're just going to put you all three at the same level. And he misses the point 
And we know he misses the point because then the fog comes down, right? And we do know this part, this detail was not um, withheld from us. And the fog comes down, I kind of talked about Lockmere's fog, remember? A heavy fog is kind of a mystical, holy experience. Um, kind of the same way a blind person can hear really well or a blind person can smell really well. Sometimes having one sense covered makes you aware of other things around you. So the fog comes down and God just says, listen to my son, Peter. Listen to my son. This isn't about you. This isn't about you fixing the problem. This isn't about your ways. Just listen to Jesus for two minutes. It's not about us. So we don't have all the answers. So I don't have a sermon prepared for you all today that gives you those answers. In fact, I'm going to give you more questions today than answers. Sorry about that. Um, but that's where we're at. We are not in control. Sometimes bad things happen to good people because that's what happens. And it's not always fair. And we don't have all the answers. And it's uncomfortable. But sometimes if you go into a situation and you try to fix all the problems, and that's what you're not called to do, does that help or make it worse? Many times, okay, if there was more men in the room, and you're being honest, you know that would be funny. Because this is a very stereotypical situation. Women have problems, and they want to talk about their feelings. And this is gender, I know, not fair, but I'm just going to go down that road. Uh, women talk about their feelings, and then the man says, oh, no problem, I'll just build you a bar. Or, oh, no problem, you're not listening to me! Like, God just wants us to listen sometimes. Sometimes in prayer, it's okay just to sit and cry. It's okay to sit and laugh and find the world somewhat humorous. We don't have all the answers. And Transfiguration Sunday is definitely one of those Sundays where we leave with more questions than right. But... Relating back to what Psalm said, let me read to you the last line in Psalms. After he goes in about how upset he is, verse 15 through 18, let's read those. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. So even when we're sad, we're called to be thankful. For you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. So if I try to fix my problems by making a donation, does that solve the problem? The sacrifice acceptable to God, here it is, here's the sacrifice that's acceptable to God, is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. Maybe we're not the ones called to fix everything. Maybe we're simply called to come to God broken and in need and listening. Amen? Amen.